around here. Okay. We have enough room for, we can move that over some if we need to. What do you mean? It's like this way, if you don't have enough room, but it looks like oh. um, I think I've already started it. Oh, okay. So, this says love. Hey, at least it works this week, so I think I've already started it. And people stand for We'll stand for hymns. Um, we stand for the creed. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, no, to the. Oh, but I did the app. I had all the right stuff. I wanted to go to the Facebook page. Yeah, all of that. Yeah, it's just like the Oh, okay. 
You know what Morning, everyone. Morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and those who are like mothers to others. Uh, glad we could be outside today. We welcome Reverend Ed Cross. It's going to be with us for a couple of Sundays in May. He's also our session moderator as we transition from Aaron uh, being our pastor. A couple of announcements in the bulletin and some that are not. Um, one that's not in there is we are starting a playground renovation project. So this is going to be our mission project for this year. Um, there'll be more information in the coming weeks, but we've already formed a committee. Some of our younger members are on that committee, um, starting with Ree, one of our younger members, and uh, <laughs> Mary Beth and Sam Hall and Peter Hart, Elizabeth Hart and Robert Sweet. And they've got some documentation and they'll probably have some flyers for you. But we're looking to raise some money, do some landscaping, get new equipment, more swings. Um, it is a good community outreach project. A lot of children in the neighborhood still use the playground um, and enjoy the playground. And we may also work in some outreach with like maybe many Bible schools since we probably will not have our large vacation Bible school again this year. Is everything okay? She can't hear. Oh. Well. <laughs> uh, We're testing the uh, live stream. There's also, I have a speaker in my purse if you want to go get it and look it up. That speaker I had. My Maybe. <laughs> oh. Um, no sound on our live feed right now, so we're working. <laughs> Session will meet next Sunday after worship. Um, don't forget if you'd like to volunteer to help set up for worship services on Sundays, if you'd be here about 10.30, 10.45 or so, um, that would be good. <laughs> also, I want to uh, bring your attention to the flowers at the front. Um, these are in loving memory of our sister in Christ, Stacey Selden. Um, she was a Sunday school teacher, lifelong member, cleaned the church for us every week. Um, her passing has been a shock and a sadness for us this week, and uh, those flowers are in memory of her. Are there any other announcements? Oh, yes, Hannah <laughs> <laughs> graduates from Christopher Newport uh, next week. She finished her last exams um, with basically straight A's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She'll be uh, starting a graduate program and she's also will be working as graduate assistant, graduate assistant um, which will help pay for her graduate courses um, for another year at Christopher Newport. So congratulations <laughs> to Hannah. Thank you. But I can't figure out the microphone. She still can't figure out the microphone, but, but <laughs> I don't know if you want me to speak to you. It's in the first in my first in the hall. Okay. <laughs> so with that, um, we'll begin worship. As we 
gather together this morning in God's presence, I invite us to stand as we're able as we join together in the call to worship. God calls us together in God's presence to lead us through death to life. Here may the faithful find salvation. Here may the doubting find faith. Here may the weary find rest. Here may we meet the crucified and risen Christ. And share more fully in the world. As we move into God's presence, it is, it is good for us to confess our need for grace and forgiveness. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our confession to God. Let us pray. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life, that you might work through me. I gave a small part, that I might not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you, only when it is convenient for me to do so only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive me, renew me, send me out as an instrument of your peace, that I might share fully in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. While it is true we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who seek the mercy of God, I say to you that in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
as we prepare to hear, to receive God's word, let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that in hearing your word, we may also do your will. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commandments so you may love one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is a joy for me to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Ed Cross. I am have been p- uh, pastor in the Presbytery of the James for almost 15 years now. Um, I've spent almost 20 years in uh, congregational ministry with a focus on uh, Christian education and pastoral care, and I'm currently uh, serving as a hospice chaplain. Um, so this is a, a wonderful way for me to stay connected to the, the work, the mission of the Presbytery, and also uh, the people of God that I have uh, given myself to serving. So in popular culture, some of you may be familiar with fan fiction. We're fans of a story series, Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, write their own stories that take place in those worlds. These might be stories that describe the backstory of a character, whether major or minor, or they might be stories that imagine what happened between movies or between book installments. Now, I've read and studied and meditated on the Bible for all of my adult life, which is longer than I care to admit. And so I have a few pieces of fan fiction about the Bible. Now, one of those, I don't promise that any of them are good, but one of them involves the 13th disciple. And in my imagining, this 13th disciple, he wasn't so much called by Jesus as much as he kind of glommed on to Jesus and the community of 12 disciples. This 13th disciple, let's let's just call him Bob, is a kind of public relations consultant and branding manager. He sees the energy, the passion, the commitment of Jesus, and he thinks Jesus can go far. But Jesus, he just seems a bit too idealistic. He he doesn't really know how the world really works. So with Bob's help, he wants to show Jesus the ropes and manage his career as he climbs the ladder. But poor Bob doesn't know what he's gotten himself into. Jesus heals someone and then commands them not to tell a soul. How can he build his brand if there is no buzz and people keep their mouths shut? He heals them and then doesn't take credit for the healing. He says, your faith has made you well. Why won't this guy take credit for the good work he does? That's no way to build a public image. 
And then Jesus antagonizes the religious leaders who could help him network effectively. Jesus is terrible at winning friends and influencing people. Not long into Jesus' ministry, Bob quits because Jesus just will not work with him. One of the shocking things about Jesus' ministry is the kind of attention he pays to specific, particular people. Jesus never championed some vague, idealistic notion of love. Instead, he touched and healed lepers and those who were considered unclean and dangerous to be near. He listened to the loneliness of a woman whose illness had made her untouchable, whose illness had left her out of polite society for over a decade. When he was in worship one Sabbath morning, he refused to turn a blind eye to the person with an obvious disability, even though Jesus knew healing him then and there would be grounds of accusation because it was work on the Sabbath. And the same Jesus who commanded his disciples to love their enemies, to pray for those who persecute them, was the same Jesus who prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do when he was being crucified. Jesus was not committed to love in general. He was committed to loving the particular person before him. In our reading from John's Gospel, Jesus says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love, there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus says this hours before he is crucified. He knows he is preparing his disciples for his death, but they do not understand. Now, because we know Jesus spoke these words, just before he willingly, knowingly handed himself over to death, we tend to hear this invitation to lay down one's life as the ultimate sacrifice, as being willing to die so that others may live. But Jesus didn't lay down his life only in his crucifixion, only in his death. He laid down his life Every time he gave of himself for others, for his entire life. In the words of Paul's letter to the Philippians, when the Son became human, he laid aside power and glory, choosing not to use his power to exploit others, but instead to serve them. When Jesus touched, healed, blessed those reckoned as sinners, as unclean, he laid down his reputation, knowing that those with power would regard him with suspicion. When Jesus interpreted the law and prophets in such a way that revealed God's call to love, he laid down his life by challenging the self-righteousness, the self-interest of the religious establishment. When Jesus commands us to love one's enemies instead of seeking victory over them, he lays down his life by refusing to unite people around a common enemy and became an outsider. In the church today, it can be especially difficult to heed Jesus' call to lay down our lives. When we are worried about surviving, the challenges and changes that are happening all around us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and pastor during Hitler's reign of evil. Bonhoeffer had had the opportunity to live out World War II in America, 
but he knew that if he wanted to help Germany rebuild after the war, he had to endure it with them. Bonhoeffer was arrested for his resistance to Hitler and executed weeks before his prison camp was liberated by Allied forces. Bonhoeffer was devastated at the failure of Christians and churches in Germany to resist Hitler precisely because they were so concerned with maintaining their influence and power. When hospitals were mandated by Hitler's government to fire Jewish doctors, what would have happened if Christian doctors went on strike until their Jewish colleagues were reinstated? When Jews were purged from the military, from the police, from teaching positions, from ordained Christian ministry, from any kind of employment, how might things have been different if, in 1934, Christians refused to go along? How might the world have been different if the church decided to lay down its life for its Jewish neighbors instead of protecting itself? In light of this failure of the church, Bonhoeffer wrestled with who Jesus Christ is for a world in chaos, in a culture that was no longer Christian. In words simple and profound, Bonhoeffer said, Jesus Christ is the man who exists for the sake of others. Jesus Christ is the one who does not live by a cost-benefit analysis, but what is needed for the person before him, friend, enemy, or on the fence to flourish. It is striking that when Jesus heals someone, he never asked for anything in return. He didn't leverage his good works to gain influence, because if he did, they wouldn't be works of love. Instead, Jesus laid down his life, his time, his attention, his energy, his love for the person before him. When Jesus calls his disciples his friends, it's because they know who he is and what drives him. It's not power, it's not money, it's not status, it's not fame, it's not popularity. It is love. Love revealed in the washing of the disciples' feet, a task meant to be done by the person with the lowest status, not the highest. So what does it look like for us to be friends of Jesus, to share in the ways the living Christ continues to lay down his life. In my work as a hospice chaplain, I visit a patient who is in her late 90s. While her family has roots in Virginia, she lived in California since she was 13 years old. She never had children, and when she realized she needed to be closer to family, her niece invited her to live near her in Virginia. But it's interesting. It's an interesting story. Her niece was in her 50s when she met her aunt, who was in her 70s at the time. There was no lifelong connection between them. This patient has been bedbound for several years, and her niece takes incredible care of her aunt moving her regularly in the bed so she doesn't get pressure wounds, bathing her, caring for her day in and day out, gladly, with great care and joy. There is nothing glamorous about the love and care she gives to her aunt, something that is unseen by nearly everybody. But every time I visit them, I am reminded of these words of Jesus. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Such care may seem so small 
in the face of so many challenges. But if we don't share friendship with Jesus and the seemingly small things, will we be friends of Jesus who share in his mission when the stakes are high? We sometimes forget that Jesus spent his three years of public ministry by and large with the same 12 people. When he healed people, he never approached a village and as he kind of cruised by Main Street said, all of your sick are healed. Instead, he took time to notice them, to talk to them, to listen to them, to bless them, to befriend them. None of us here has the cure for cancer. But we can offer our time, our attention, our energy, our love to the person with cancer. None of us here has the cure to grief. But we can be sure that someone does not face their grief alone. We all have our bad days. But this doesn't mean we can't share in someone else's joy. Henry Nouwen was a priest and a prolific author on prayer and the spiritual life. He once received a letter from a PhD student who had a lot of academic questions. In his letter back, Nouwen wrote, as I think about my life and work, I think of it more as a way of being present to people with all I have. I've always tried to respond as honestly as possible to the needs and concerns of the people who became part of my life, and I have tried to respond with whatever my own life has taught me. This act of being present, of truly seeing the people around us, it seems so small. But what happened when God saw the suffering and heard the cries of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt? What happened when Moses paid attention to that burning bush and decided to take a closer look? What happened when Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, James and John, mending their nets by the Sea of Galilee? There's an organization here in Richmond called Embrace Communities. It focuses on helping communities thrive, not by identifying everything that is wrong, but identifying the strengths and hopes of the people who live in them. And this organization began when its founder, Wendy, volunteered when they hosted homeless guests through Caritas. One of these homeless people, Shannon, was due to have her first child in a few months, and Wendy felt compelled to stay in touch with her after the week that Shannon spent in her church. When Shannon got an apartment a few months later, Wendy went to visit her and her newborn and was shocked to find that there was not a stick of furniture in the place. Homeless people can't afford a storage unit when they lose their home. So Wendy sent out word to her church and soon had a garage full. Of furniture. From this, she founded a furniture bank, and as she got to know more people and more communities, her strategies changed, but her mission stayed the same, to develop leaders, often through churches, that could help neighbors and their neighborhoods thrive. Now, this didn't happen because Wendy had any relevant experience. She was an accountant by training when all this began, but it happened because she paid attention to Shannon. She followed the road, even though she had no idea where it would take her. At the center of the gospel is God moving to our neighborhood to befriend us in Jesus Christ. God became vulnerable in Jesus, so we could see that God's purpose is not grounded in power or control, but in love. The Presbyterian theologian William Plaker notes that those who act out of power 
are unreliable because they want to protect themselves. They want to be powerful so they are not vulnerable. But a God who is grounded not in power but in love is one who will be with us and for us, who will not let go because such a God is not afraid of suffering, whether our suffering or God's own suffering in the death of Jesus. May we share a deep friendship with the God revealed in Jesus Christ, a God whose extraordinary love is made real in ordinary acts, whose courage and strength is revealed in vulnerability, and whose power is made perfect in weakness. Amen.
As we respond to God's word, I now invite us to join together in our affirmation of faith from a brief statement of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating without casts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life and breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. On behalf of you may be seated. On uh, behalf of the session, I want to, to thank you for your continued support of Amtill Presbyterian Church. And I know as many of you know, um, you may leave your offering on the table. And let us now offer a prayer of dedication for your gifts of financial resources, your gifts of time and energy and love. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that allows us to share in your mission, in your purposes, in your church, and in the world. For the gifts of this congregation, gifts of resources, spiritual gifts, gifts of deep love and devotion to you, to one another, and to their families and communities, we give you thanks. Bless the offering of your church in the many forms it takes, that disciples will be made, and that the world will know that you have drawn near to us in the love of Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. As we continue to respond to the grace, the presence, the love of God at work in our midst, let us join our hearts and minds together in prayer. We thank you, O God, that in the words of your servant Isaiah, you cannot forget us any more than a mother can forget the child she is nursing. We thank you that just as a mother loves their two-year-old or four-year-old or 40-year-old with a love that is beyond measure, so you love us wherever and whenever we are in our lives. Hear us as we offer thanks for the women who have been mothers and mentors and encouragers to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yet, like a mother who fully and completely loves their child as they are, you also want us to grow and mature. May your love for us right here, right now, enliven us and cause us to grow, cause us to share ever more fully in your work of bringing release to the captives, freedom to the oppressed, comfort to the brokenhearted, pardon to sinners. When we feel like we are in over our heads, Remind us of the truth that you do not call those who are already prepared to share in your work. Instead, you prepare those whom you have called. So hear us as we come to you in prayer to seek ways to share more fully in your work, in our lives, in your church, and the world. As we seek to share in your work of reconciliation, 
hear us as we pray for our enemies, for those who have hurt us, that we may be free from pain and anger and free for mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear us as we pray for those whom we have hurt, that we may repent and do what is in our power to be reconciled to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As we seek to share in your work of healing, hear us as we pray for those who are in pain from grief, from illness, from addiction, from depression and despair, that they might find wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Keep our hearts soft enough that they still break over the pain of others. When we are angry at the state of things, may our anger make not make us cruel and jaded, but fuel our work for your kingdom seeking all we need to receive your love and respond to your call here and now. Hear us as we come together as one with the prayer Jesus has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise as we join in the singing of our hymn of sending. and sisters, confidence that the grace, that the love, that the power of God is already at work in our midst, that we have right now all that we need to love God and love neighbor well, I charge you to go out into the world in peace, 
have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil from evil, but strengthen the brokenhearted. Help the suffering. Encourage the struggling. Honor all people and rejoice in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God the Father, and in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Yeah, okay, good. Heather, did you stop them? I think you stopped the feed. <laughs> oh. 